So briefly, the World as It Could Be program was our uh, effort to basically raise awareness about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that I'm hoping has some familiarity now among everybody here. It was the document that Eleanor Roosevelt shepherded through the United Nations uh, and had adopted by the General Assembly December 10, 1948. What we are doing is raising awareness about the Universal Declaration because we have learned that while it is meant to be taught as part of social studies curriculum, it's in the standards in California and in many other states to be taught in high school in the, at least the 10th grade, if not the 11th and 12th, only 6% of the U.S. population knows it exists. And yet we feel it's a very powerful frame of reference for really understanding how we can all work together to create the kind of environment that, that everyone has respect for each other's dignity and human rights and really, as Eleanor Roosevelt envisioned, was the way to stop wars, to stop violence, and all that gave birth to the UDHR, which gives it even special relevance tonight. We, um, because the arts have played a big role in us seeing how important it was for young people especially to grasp the meaning of the concepts of the Universal Declaration and seeing that the arts have been dwindling in support in the schools, we set about to pilot curriculum, which we did here, to integrate the creative arts as an integral part of teaching the Universal Declaration in language arts and social studies classes so that the arts would see, be seen as part of good education, not as something that is just kind of discretionary if there's enough money. And um, so one of the other aspects was to have a culminating presentation, which we felt was important as we saw with the dramatic productions put on by the youth at, at Destiny Arts and the youth of Youth Speaks uh, working together that it created a form of a rite of passage for youth to have an opportunity to publicly demonstrate what they learned about human rights and the Universal Declaration in a way that gave them the opportunity to be the teachers and leaders and be respected and celebrated by their peers and community. And it's been tremendously successful. Uh, one of the things that led to tonight is uh, this idea of a rite of passage has been tremendously important to us, and I had the privilege of being introduced to Frederick Marx a few months ago and was explaining the project, and as I was explaining this culminating presentation, all excited, he said, Sandy, I'm doing this documentary work on the importance of rites of passage for youth. And so began what I feel is such a treasured connection and an opportunity to bring to our community um, what this is all about. And so with, without further ado, and, and just to briefly explain, we're gonna start the first half of the evening with Frederick presenting his information about rites of passage and then have the opportunity to talk together about what we've learned and how to really turn that and the work we're doing around Universal Declaration and the arts uh, to think about how to engage youth around the change needed to end violence and gun use. So I wish to now, uh, with great pleasure, introduce Frederick. Many of you may know him through a wonderful movie called Hoop Dreams. Uh, and here he is to now bring us some vital information for our youth and our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy, for inviting me here tonight. It's a real honor and a privilege. Uh, I'm a born-again rites of passage and mentorship believer for young people, and so anywhere, anytime I can take the message out, I love it. So, so thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, you know, just as a footnote, another thing that we found, Sandy and I, when we first sat down and, and, and talked, uh, while I was making hoop dreams in the early 90s, I was actually, for a period of time, making a real living. And uh, that real living came in the form of co-producing and editing a documentary uh, called Out of the Silence to celebrate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we made it um, in the early 90s. It was to commemorate, at that time, the 35th anniversary of the signing of the UDHR. So uh, at some other time and place, I'd love to show you some of that because it, it, gives you, it would give you perfect background on the signing of the document, the amazing thing that Eleanor Roosevelt managed to get through the UN, and, and just what an impact it's having around the world is, is remarkable, but for another time. So, uh, 
So tonight, uh, I, I want to start and go very California on you. So uh, if you just entertain me for just a moment, I'd invite you to just close your eyes. I'm going to give you a little brief guided meditation here. Uh, and I, I won't keep you too long because I know you got food on your plates. So, <laughs> so I, I really invite you to imagine a world where all teens have a real deep sense of purpose for their own lives that they're all connected to their own deepest passions. And imagine a world where all teens are brought to know their own physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional limits so they don't have to seek them out through unconscious trials. Imagine a world where all teens know the rights and responsibilities of adulthood and feel welcome and accepted by other adults in their communities as co-equals. And imagine a world in which all parents know when it's time to let their teen children go forth on their own and in order to welcome them back as co-equal adults. And that they're actually culturally and institutionally supported in doing so. And lastly, imagine a world where there's no more suspended adolescence running the country, running corporations, running institutions. They're not teenagers in adult clothing. So thank you for, for entertaining me. You can open your eyes now. That's, that's the vision that I've been holding for some time. How do we get to that world? So I just want to tell you briefly, just back up and tell you how I got to this point. First of all, uh, my film production company, we're based in downtown Oakland. It's called Warrior Films. And our mission is very simple. It's four words, bearing witness, creating change. And basically what we do is we bear witness to real stories, real people, real lives, and we use those stories to craft dramatic, emotional, suspenseful stories. And then we utilize those stories to deploy them with community stakeholders to create needed social change. So for me, this journey to this point began really when I was about nine years old. And my dad died very suddenly. He had a heart attack. And he was literally in my life forever one day and then gone forever the next, and I never had a chance to say goodbye to him. And then on the way to the funeral, my uncle, he put his hand on my shoulder and he goes, OK, Freddie, you're the man of the house now. And I was the oldest son. I was nine. I had an older sister and, of course, my mother. So in a sense, the seed for this journey began in that moment for me. Because I asked myself, well, what is it to be a man? And how do I possibly become that man that I want to be in my life? How can I do that? Who is there to support that passage? So, you know, I was extremely lucky because as a teen, you know, I lived in a very safe and small town, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, a college town, basically. So even though I put my own life continually at risk through drug and alcohol abuse when I was a teen, I was contained and held, in a sense, by the community. So fortunately, I never lost my life. And I, very fortunately, never saw any of my friends lose their lives. But I never was initiated and I never was mentored into being that man that I wanted to become. So this, this question kept living on in me all through my 20s and into my 30s. And, and just to make this story short, you know, in the wake of making Hoop Dreams, how many of you have seen Hoop Dreams? I'm just curious. Oh my gosh. OK, great. <laughs> in the wake of making Hoop Dreams, you know, the, the question that lived on in me uh, subsequent to that film was, you know, who in the adult community is there to support these young men to fully realize themselves in their lifetime rather than exploit them <laughs> for their own ends? You know, whether they're coaches, teachers, or even parents sometimes. So, so I moved in 2000 to Newark, New Jersey, and I, and I made a film called Boys to Men, question mark. Because at that time, I was really, really interested in t 
taking a snapshot of teen boys and just finding out how are they doing in this world? How are they managing to navigate that transition from adolescence into adulthood? And who's helping them in a meaningful way? Uh, and actually, I need to back up because I skipped a step, a very important step. It was 1995 when I finally myself had what I consider to be my long overdue initiation into what I call mature masculinity. <laughs> I was almost 40 years old, but at least better late than never. And, that, and for me, it was just a, a weekend men's workshop. Some of you may have heard of the organization called the Mankind Project. And it's a 48-hour workshop called the New Warrior Training Adventure. And it was never designed to be an initiation for men, but in fact, it's so powerful that it's become one. And it certainly had that impact on my life. So some of the things that I learned on that weekend were things that I'd sought all my life as a boy and then as a young man. Accountability and integrity. You know, how can I m walk my talk? so that everything that I say is actually something that I do and that I'm committed to that. My word is my bond. My personal belief is that every boy and every young man actually seeks that life of honor. They want to live that way, but they don't have the tools, they don't have the mechanisms in order to accomplish it. So that's one of the things that I learned on this weekend is some real tools to be accountable, to be an in integrity. Another thing that I learned was about uh, how to track and manage my rich emotional life. You know, especially as men in this culture, that's not something that we're readily taught, right? Generally, we're still taught the old male model of basically stuff it, <laughs> repress your emotions, you know, don't cry, don't show fear, right? Well, this is toxic. I mean, it's a horrible thing. So anyway, one of the things that we teach on this weekend, and now I'm one of the teachers that does it, we teach men a deep awareness of their own emotional life. And we teach them how to utilize these emotions to get behind them and, and, and actually use them for strength and energy rather than repress and deny them. Another thing that I learned which was really huge for me is about what I call mission or life purpose. You know, I had a sense even long before this that my life purpose was somehow tied up with making films on this planet. Because that's what I've been doing since I was about 22, 23. But this weekend taught me something much deeper than that about how there's something about who I am as a man in the world that has to be expressed through the films that I make. There are a lot of different lessons that I learned, but one of them really boiled down to, I thought, both of my parents were professors, so I thought, okay, my gift in life is like them, it's my intellect, right? Well, it was this weekend that finally taught me, no, it's not, it's my heart. It's actually my vulnerable, sensitive, emotional heart. That's what is actually my gift to the planet, and hopefully that shows up in some of the films that I make. Another lesson that it taught me was what I call shadows. It's a neo-Jungian term. It's all of that darkness that lives, I would argue, in every one of us. Certainly, I have plenty of it. All of that stuff that we'd rather hide, repress, and deny, and say isn't there, but in fact is there for all of us in one way, shape, and form, or form. So, on this weekend, I had some very powerful men who were willing to stand in the heat of my fury, my resistance, my anger, and hold a very powerful mirror up to me and say, take a look, because this is who you are too. And this is powerful, this is important, and this is one more thing we need to do with our young people. And lastly, the, the lesson that I learned was service. That actual fulfillment in life actually comes not through consumption, but through giving these gifts that I have as freely as possible. That that's actually how we get to live fulfilled and happy lives. By actually giving what are our unique gifts as human beings. So, not coincidentally, a lot of these lessons are exactly the same lessons that are the fruit of most initiatory practices for young people. 
So I told you about moving to Newark and making the film Boys to Men. Halfway through that process, I realized, you know what, this isn't going to cut it. Because the, the film sort of turned into a, a statement of the problem in a broad sense. It's all about teen boys, beautiful boys, uh, and a rainbow of faces, you know, vulnerable, intelligent, sensitive, caring boys struggling mightily to find some image of mature masculinity to align their lives with. And they're flailing at it, and they're desperate for it, and they're not getting it. So I thought, I've got to make a film about solutions. And that's what led me on the journey to where I am now, making a film called Rites of Passage. And actually, as of three days ago, <laughs> the subtitle is now changed. Rites of Passage, Mentoring the Future. So let me show you this trailer for the film. The debate is still raging about why the riots happened and why these criminals relished the destruction. The senior police officer had called the perpetrators feral rats. Teen and preteen drug and alcohol abuse. The problem is as pervasive as it is poisonous. A 14-year-old boy confessed to starting last night's fire. A 14-year-old and an 18-year-old stole a car and then led them on a chase. Teenage bullying and teasing is an epidemic in this country, and the death rate is climbing. Series of murders and shootings. A small group of young punks were involved. It was mayhem. Teens are self-inducing abortions. Today, we're talking about boys so body-obsessed they're putting their own lives at risk. He had taken three ecstasy pills and then murdered his parents. Yesterday, a 15-year-old took her own life. A teenager killing her nine-year-old neighbor. Teenagers rampaged through the midway late Wednesday. When a culture doesn't provide formal rites of passage or initiations, then you get usually destructive versions of it. I think if I was initiated and mentored as a teen, I wouldn't have had a breakdown when I was 20. I wouldn't have lost one of my best friends to suicide. What we needed as young people was something that didn't exist, a form of support that didn't exist in our culture. Our parents were busy with their own work and relationships and responsibilities and midlife transitions. Our schools were busy trying to help us reach the targets and succeed in the tests and reach the goals. There was nobody that was just looking out for our souls. One of the functions of initiation is to bring the young people fully into the community. And there, of course, is a longing for that. And it's in all the young people I see. It's in the colleges, but it's also in the street gangs. And it, it can't be removed. The work of initiating belongs to the community. Initiation serves to help boys as well as girls to rechannel that energy into a more appropriate form that actually serves the community, serves their family, serves the causes that they want to serve. The real beauty of Rites of Passages and why I found it to be a profound, like, aha, this is the map, because 
it is in every single culture and every spiritual, deep spiritual tradition, they have this map of rite of passage. step into manhood, one of the first steps into manhood. You guys aren't going to believe this, but in 48 hours, when you look around, you're going to see 16 friends. There's 50 men up there. 50 men? 50 men that are waiting for you guys. 50 of them. Mom's here. I want you to go tell her goodbye. You're going to be a different person when you come back. Can you let me? Oh my god. Bye. Bye. Start to think about what your mission is, what you want to do, what you're going to be. I'm almost guys. I'm a single mom, and I've been searching for help for some time because it's been quite a struggle. It was frightening as a mom to send your only son, your baby, off with a bunch of men you never met. And when he came back, my son openly communicated with me his feelings, which is the first time he's ever done that. I've lived so long with this wall of just being a tough guy. Boys and Men has helped me find that wall. And slowly, day by day, I'm chipping it away. My mom has seen some of the light, but I just can't wait to show her all of it. Yeah. In the society that we call a primitive society, they would know immediately whether that man was initiated or not. And the women would know it. And they'd be horrified by some kid who isn't initiated becoming a president. Initiation and mentorship has helped me by uh, realizing that it's okay to cry, um, not just in front of like men, but in front of women, without feeling like you're any less of a man. After my initiation with women, every time I feel myself, like the, my foundation wavering, instead of needing to, to run to my husband or to these usual go-to people that are holding so much, it's, it's my sisters. It's, it's the women that can really hold me. I want to I want to just take a a couple more minutes and and share with you you know some of what my research and, and experience has taught me uh, for the last 15 years about what are some of the benefits of of proper initiation and mentorship. One of them is that I think young people gain a sense of their place in the cosmos which I know sounds ambitious, but that's my experience, that they get a, a, at least a glimpse into this amazing paradox that on one hand, they're insignificantly small in the greater scheme of the entire universe, and at the same time, paradoxically, they're absolutely vital and essential, and that there's no end to the ripples of positive impact and change that they can have so that they understand both sides of that paradoxical equation. They also have a sense of kind of where they fit in in the fabric of life. You know, ideally, every young person is initiated into a cultural, historical tradition. And it's no accident that the major religions have all had their own uh, rites of passage for years, Catholic confirmation, Jewish bar and bat mitzvah. Uh, so, 
they, they get a sense that they're part of the lineage of time. They get a sense of where they fit in in generativity, as I call it. You know, the generational linkages through time and, and where their ancestors came from. They also have that sense of, I mentioned already, of mission or purpose. You know, for me, one of the great crimes of the last 200 plus years is that, you know, 10 generations or more of children have been brought onto the planet without having a deep appreciation of how uniquely wonderful and precious they are. And that each person's mission, <laughs> in a sense, in life is to find out what those gifts are what makes them special and unique, and then to give them as freely as possible to others. And they also have to know, and I touched on this too, about service. That in giving those gifts, that's how you create meaningful community. You know, that, uh, that adult life is basically about community. It's not about the self. You know, another may, maybe even simpler way of saying what initiation about, is about at this age, it's about dying not literally, but symbolically, to that adolescent childhood self, that, that part of us that wants me, 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 it's about me, and being born into that adult self that says, it's us, it's us, it's us. They also have a deep sense of what their physical and mental capacities are. You know, they so desperately, it's not an accident that they push up against every boundary that's put on them, right, in their teen years. That's part of why they're doing it. They're desperate to find out what the reach is of their physical bodies, of their mental bodies, of their spiritual bodies. They want to know those limits. And a, and, a, and a proper ritual container that's a rite of passage can teach them those limits. So. And feelings, I mentioned that already. Uh, you know, ultimately, it's about self-empowerment. You know, it's a huge confidence builder. So it's about them learning that uh, to think and act for themselves, basically. To think and act for themselves. But at the same time, to be inter-independent. Inter-independent. So that they're, they're, they're self-empowered, they can make wonderful reasoned choices for their own lives, and they recognize that they live in community. That, they have to, that the choices that they make are going to have an impact on others, and they have to think through those impacts. You get a, you get a, a quick sense of it in the, in the trailer, but I'll just elaborate a little bit more. You know, there are a lot of different thinkers and philosophers and writers have talked about the different stages of initiatory practice. But at its most base, at its most simple, there's really three. And you just saw them in, 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 a, in a brief glimpse in the trailer. The first stage is called separation or descent. So you have to take people, uh, hi, welcome, come on in. <laughs> You have to remove them from everyday life, basically. You know, some, some thinkers have said no person in their right mind is going to do the, the two of the key things that initiation accomplishes. One, takes a person right to stare death in the face. Okay? This is your mortality. Take a good look. Because you're not going to be on this planet indefinitely. And the second thing is, say goodbye to mom and dad. Because that too has to end if you're going to stand on your own two feet as a grown woman or as a grown man. You have to separate them. So you have to remove them from everyday life. You have to separate them from mom and dad. And that's why initiation historically and traditionally was never accomplished by the parents. Because it's not their role. It's, it, it, to, to see their own children possibly brought to the, the edge of death? No. That's for the uncles and the aunties and the grandfathers and the grandmothers to make it safe enough but dangerous enough so that they learn the vital lessons that they need to learn. So you separate them from daily life and of course today that means from computers, cell phones, uh, video games, all of that stuff 
You also separate them from all kinds of other things that they're used to. Uh, clock time, in effect. You know, you separate them from chronos, and you begin to enter them into sacred time. Keros, as the Greeks called it. You know, the time it takes for a tree to flower. The time it takes for a star to die and be reborn. Sacred time. So in the middle, the second stage is ordeal. The physical, emotional, mental, spiritual trial. You have to cook them. <laughs> you have to cook them. You've got to give them real trials, real tests. It's not just playtime. You've got to give them something that's really going to put them to the test. And the forms of this, of course, have been different across the planet throughout time. But they're all equally beautiful in their own cultural ways. So Native Americans, a traditional one, well, of course, there's the Sundance ceremony. That's one. Uh, another one is, is to go, uh, after uh, a sacred lodge being poured, to go sit on a hill somewhere for three days and nights with no food, no water, to fast and pray for a vision that's going to inform the depth and meaning of your life. Uh, you know, it's less common now in Africa, but it still exists. You know, among, I think, the, I believe the Maasai warriors are still doing this, putting a spear in the hand of a young person to hunt an, a, a lion. And in today's contemporary context, we don't have to do those things. What we can do is we can take young people down into the depths of their own being and say, take a good look at your own shadows and your own fears and take a good look in the mirror. Because that's the purpose of all of these trials anyway, is to test your limits of your capacity to feel fear, for example. So, and then the final stage, the return or the homecoming. So after this transformation that the young people have been through, where hopefully they've died to that small self, to that adolescent me, me, me self, and been reborn into a greater sense of the cosmic whole and where they fit in, they have to be ritually welcomed back into the community. They have to be reintroduced to their parents, but this time as co-equals. They're no longer son and daughter. And in many different African villages, for example, they are given a separate hut. They do not go back into the home of the mother and the father. So, 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 so that's, and of course they have hopefully that sense of life purpose. They usually have a new name. They take on a name so that it's, uh, uh, that, that they don't identify any longer with that child self. They have a literal new name. Scarification is really common, right? Where you have some kind of scar on your body as a physical symbol, as a reminder of what you've been through to, to be to serve as like a talisman to remind you for the rest of your life of that transformation. And I hope some of these things that I'm saying are reverberating in your minds in contemporary culture because there's no accident, right, that so many young people are getting tattoos, you know, or, or earrings or whatnot. You know, what some of us as elders might think of as scarification way. Why would you do that? That's terrible. It's, it's a, I think my belief is it's an unconscious need to go through that ritual of transformation, to mark themselves as an adult, to see, also to test their capacity to feel pain. So there's, I've already touched on a lot of the different forms that exist around the planet. You know, it's interesting, uh, in Thailand, it's still very common for uh, young men to serve a year in a Buddhist monastery when they hit their late teens. And I'm told that uh, a wise Thai woman will never marry somebody who hasn't been through that form of service. You know? Because they don't want to marry a, a potential uninitiated man. Right? They want a mature man. So, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to skip some of what I, I see to be uh, essential qualities there are certain characteristics that I think apply universally to all forms of initiation. But, but one of the things that 
that I do want to touch on is, and the film is going to do this, you know, it, it drives me crazy that in, 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 in popular culture, you know, we, we bandy about this term rites of passage. And we do so quite commonly and I think quite detrimentally. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to basically uh, repossess the term and, and put behind it what are really positive and growthful rites of passage and separate it off once and for all from what are either negative rites of passage or, or neutral ones that don't carry some transformative capacity. So some of the neutral ones, I mean, we talk about this all the time, right? You're turning 18, oh, it's a rite of passage. You're getting your driver's license. You get to vote for the first time, right? None of those really have that transformative capacity. And then, you know, the unhealthy ones, but that do have some transformative capacity. Joining a gang, for instance, right? It's no accident why young people are drawn to gangs. They desperately yearn for that, that belonging. They desperately learn to be of service to a group, right? They desperately yearn to be initiated. Unfortunately, there's no elders <laughs> in gangs, right? And, that, and, and the energies and attentions that they have, all of that brilliance, all of that fire, is misdirected. And if there were elders in the community, they'd say, guys, we can put you to good use here. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of positive things we can do. So, and of course, it's not just gangs. I mean, fraternity hazing, bullying, uh, speed drinking, you know, committing your first crime, uh, street drag racing, a lot of these kinds of trials are kind of pseudo initiations. So, what's needed are just healthy, community-based, culturally specific rites of passage, guided by our elders. I'm going to pause, <laughs> take a breath, and I'm going to actually just invite you to uh, ask questions. 